And what people are supposed to look at is this wine barrel. And this is at the 1904 World's Fair held in St. Louis. So wine barrels in Argentina, these, this was photograph was taken um, by me when I was in Mendoza, Argentina in 2012 at a vineyard. And I asked the guy at the vineyard, where are these barrels from? And he said, they are from America. And I said, where in America? And he said, Missouri. Then I pointed to his vineyard and I said, where are your rootstocks from? And he said, America. And I said, where in America? And he said, Missouri. So I'm gonna talk about the history of Missouri wine and wineries. I'm Doug Schneider and I am impartial. I do not drink wine and I don't drink any alcohol. So I'm not pushing any product for you folks. Well, let's look at the grapes uh, that Missouri grows. And the grape that first comes to mind is the Norton grape, root in history and aged to perfection. And this is the official state grape of Missouri. And um, here's what it looks like, nice and dark. And here is a book about this grape. Not how, how to grow the grape, not how to make wine from the grape, but how this grape has affected people's lives, has affected people's lives, the Norton grape. And uh, here is a bottle of Norton from Stonehill. I want a little prize. Now, this guy, Doug Frost, he, uh, he is uh, one of three people in the world who has a master of wine and a master of sommelier titles. And he talks about the comparison between growing, uh, making wine in Missouri and making wine in California. And wine growers need more skill than California producers because California is mimicking the work of generations before them. While in Missouri, basically every year, the Norton grape becomes difficult and they have people have to figure out how to grow it and how to make wine from it. It's a very fussy grape. And basically says a new tradition every year. So that's the Norton grape. Uh, here are just some other ones. We have the Saval Blanc, and that's a hybrid and suited to cool climates. Here's a bottle. Uh, this is a Vidal Blanc. Again, a hybrid. Again, colder climates. Here's a bottle of Vidal Blanc. Chardonnay. You can tell that this is a hybrid. You can tell one of the two parts of the hybrid, Chardonnay and Saval Blanc. Mm, so that's a, a wine plus a hybrid making another hybrid. Okay. And there's a Missouri bottle of Chardonnay. Yes. Vignol, another Missouri grape, and it's a white grape, and it's a, a French-American hybrid. It's interesting to make all sorts of wine out of that. And there is a Vignol from Hermann Hoff. You're going to hear more about this winery, Hermann Hoff, and you're certainly going to hear about the city it's in, which is Hermann, Missouri. And Traminette is a hybrid. Looks like uh, you can see the two grapes that it is a hybrid of. And it's a cross towards Traminer and Saville Blanc. And here is a bottle of Missouri Traminette. Port wine is getting a little cute here because, uh, first of all, port wine is brandy added to the wine. It's got a whole lot of alcohol in it. And I wanted to show you this bottle of Missouri port wine because it is from Rocheport in Missouri. And uh, therefore they make port wine in Rocheport. Yes, yes. And here is the Concord grape, which is an American grape. And wine is made from Concord grapes. And interestingly enough, you can make white wine out of Concord grapes, out of the, except for the expected purple wine, you can make white wine. And there's a Missouri Concord white wine bottle. Well, we're going to talk about wine making in Missouri. And basically, 
it's, bef it's before the Germans and after the Germans. So we're gonna go before the Germans. And who do we have here before the Germans? We have the French. And um, we were uh, the, the first town in Missouri to be founded was 1740. These are French people from Canada, but St. Louis, where I'm from, or where I'm living right now, uh, is founded by French people from New Orleans. And what do the French settlers do with wine? Well, here's a little picture of a church. A little uh, picket, a little fence around it. There's the church. There is the uh, residence. And obviously, it's Catholic because the settlers are from France. So if you're Catholic, you need sacramental wine. So the clergy and the Jesuits who were here made sacramental wine. The settlers themselves made wine just for household use, but they weren't interested in doing commercial wine. So French settlers, wine was part of their life, but not part of their commerce. So that's before the Germans. But the Germans came and they were interested in wine. Okay, the Germans came because this is the Missouri River and it reminded them of the Rhine. So Missouri is, or someone is going to lure Germans to Missouri. Um, and this guy who, who does the luring is named Gottfried Duden. He, he's a wealthy attorney. He lives in Germany. He sees poverty and he, he, see, he thinks that the cause of the poverty is that there's overpopulation. So the ideal thing to save, to rectify Germans, Germany's poverty is to move these people somewhere, have them emigrate somewhere. And the Gottfried Duden thinks he, he will solve these problems through emigration. But first thing he has to do is answer this very basic question. Can a German survive in America? The French didn't ask this question, the English didn't ask this question, but the Germans asked this question, can Germans survive? So this wealthy man comes to St. Louis. He finds Nathan Boone, who's Daniel Boone's son, and has Nathan Boone take him on a, a tour of the Missouri River Valley. There's Nathan. And this wealthy German fellow lives in a cabin for three years. He's not gonna tell anybody in Germany about the United States until he knows it's possible for a German to survive. And he does survive for three years and he wrote, writes a book. It's published in Germany, Bericht über eine Reise nach dem westlichen Staaten North America. And that is report on a journey in the Western states of North America. And he's got a lot of good things to say, especially about the Missouri River Valley right here. And he, he just, says it's like a dream. Living here is like a dream. And it's a fantasy full of nature. Such strong, strong words promoting Missouri River Valley. Acorns as big as eggs and grapevines heavy with sweet fruit. So there's that word, grapevine. Yes. So Germans start to come to Missouri because of this book. There were no Germans here until this guy published his book. And here's a, a German farm in Missouri, a Deutsche Farm. And what attracts Germans? There's no king, taxes are reasonable. There's no draft. Actually, my family left Germany and they didn't immigrate uh, westward. They immigrated eastward because there was no draft in Austria-Hungary. So. Anyway, that's an important thing. Famine, there's no famine, there's no overpopulation. So Germans are going to come. And in the 1830s, they start to come. And the ones who come to Missouri, fourth of them settle in St. Louis, the rest spread out in the, in the beautiful Missouri River Valley. 
and they write letters home and they talk about wonderful things that are going on and try to bring more people. And the Germans who come to the Missouri River Valley find grapes. There are grapes growing in the hills in the valley. And they were abundant. And the Germans saw these abundant grapes and said, let's make wine. No German in Missouri had ever made wine before. They were total amateurs. And this was to their advantage. None of them grew wine or made wine in Europe. To their, that's to their advantage. Never made wine before. And that's because of terroir, or if I'm not pronouncing that right, but grapes have, are, require a climate, a soil, a tradition, elevation, and so forth, means certain grapes uh, survive, and thrive, and have to be treated certain ways, uh, depending on where they are. If they had brought European winemaking methods with them from Germany, they would not have thrived. So the wine industry begins in Missouri. There, you've got a river, which is a big means of transportation. Railroads are about to be built. Uh, and that's, of course, another means of transportation. St. Louis is a large city. St. Louis was the eighth largest city in the country when it entered the Union. Uh, within a century, it became the fourth largest city in the country. So anyway, Missouri set up to become an exporter of wine. And the city of Herman, which is on the river, offers parcels of land to, to, to uh, at a very cheap rate of rental. And they have to grow, people who get these parcels of land have to grow grapes. And remember, they hadn't made wine before. They hadn't grown grapes before. They're all learning, but 60 wineries in 1860, in the city of Herman, the area of Herman, alone, alone. 60 wineries in 1860, out in the Napa Valley, zero wineries. But we had 60 just in the Herman area here in Missouri. So wine starts to be grown, people get familiar with wine, and Missouri is now primed to save France. This is a statue in Montpellier, France. And you'll see it's two women. There's a young woman and an old woman. It's an allegory. So you have the young woman, it's Missouri, and the old woman is France because Missouri saved France, basically saved French wine. What was happening, there was a blight in France in the 1860s through the 1870s. And it was destroying, destroying vineyards. And people were afraid that wine industry would be wiped out. The really scary thing is there's so many French vineyards were wiped out that the French actually started drinking whiskey imported from Great Britain. That's how desperate things were, how bad this wine blight was. In any event, people didn't know what was causing it. They, uh, they erected uh, these crosses to, to, uh, to uh, whatever they could to, to stop the blight. They tried holy water, all sorts of things. But here's the cause of this blight. And it's a louse. It's a louse. And not only is it a louse, but on a wine route, on a grapevine route, the French found hundreds, thousands of lice all sorts of stages of development. And these were killing off the French vineyards. They were everywhere. They were everywhere. But the French somehow knew. They could form a commission and they invited Charles Riley of Jefferson City, Missouri to come visit France. They knew about Charles Riley. Charles Riley was our state entomologist. He worked for the Department of Agriculture 
he had studied under Charles Darwin and he went to France and he recognized phylloxera. Phylloxera is the name of the louse. Nobody knows how to, how to kill it off. We only know how to control it. Don't know how to kill it off, know how to control it. And this was just making things messy. 40% of French vineyards destroyed by wine, 50% of wages in the wine industry in France. Uh, it just, just was really, really in the, in the 60s, the 1860s, they just didn't know what to do. Riley comes along and he has a, a solution. But this wine blight has swept the globe. It's in, it's in Australia now, it's in Argentina. And the only place that doesn't have it is Chile. And I don't know how that escaped, but that went around the world. So what did Charles Riley know? He knew that Missouri grape roots, grapevine roots, were immune. They were immune to phylloxera. So the state of Missouri sent millions of rootstocks, native Missouri rootstocks, to France. And they were then planted. And then the French wine, uh, French vines were um, grafted onto those rootstocks and the French wine industry was saved. This is about 1872. I'll just mention the town of Herman, Missouri. There was a guy there named George Hussman. He was one of the people um, who supplied, he supplied, I think he and another fellow 400,000 rootstocks and they were shipped to France and the French wine industry bounced back. Now, how did phylloxera get to France? Well, it wasn't there to start with. It came from America. The French and the Europeans went over to America because they heard they wanted to discover new types of grapes. And they took samples back to Europe and there was phylloxera on those samples. But doing this before the steamship, it took so long to get across the Atlantic Ocean that the phylloxera would die off. But then steamships came along and this took much less time to get to Europe and the phylloxera were still alive when these various samples of American grapes arrived in Europe. So that's how the phylloxera got to Europe. And we're gonna talk about George Hussman because if you're out in California, I hope you know his name, uh, but uh, he was born in Germany. He came to Herman uh, as a young boy and he would roam through the woods. He would pick grapes and other fruit. He was interested in fruit. And uh, he dreamed of vineyards and he started his own vineyard. He actually introduced the Concord grape to Missouri. But then he heard about California. The year of course, 1849. And George Hussman went out to California to try and find some gold. He was not successful. So he returned to Herman and he realized his role in life was to be an expert in wine and grape growing. And he wanted to be influential. So he started small in the County Wine Growers Association. But he wrote this book, Cultivation of the Native Grape and Manufacture of American Wines based on Missouri growing making wine and growing grapes in Missouri. So he became the authority and he became a professor of palmology at the University of Missouri. Palmology is the study of growing fruit. Now, he then went on to do a fruit nursery so he could make his money selling rootstocks to vineyards in Missouri, vineyards in France, and a few vineyards in California. But, his son was killed in a tragic gun accident and George Hussman just couldn't, couldn't bear to be in Herman or in Missouri anymore. It just was too much for him. 
So he uprooted, if that's the right word, took his family to Napa Valley in 1881. And he became, um, he, his goal was again to be an expert and influential in winemaking. Now he had been out there in 1849, but he was now out there in 1881. Two big changes that affected the California wine. First change was commercial refrigeration. And that, the reason that's important is if you make wine, you don't have to grow your own grapes. You can have somebody else grow their grapes and refrigerate <laughs> the grape juice and, to, and then make wine out of it. So that, that affects California wine. And then 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad is completed and that affects California wine because it can now be shipped anywhere in the country. So that really makes it a, a, a commercially more important rather than just supplying California with wine can supply the nation with wine. And George Hussman is right in there with his expertise. And he then writes the book on winemaking in California. And here is his gravestone. Uh, he is buried in the Napa Valley and he's a pioneer promoter of American viticulture. That's what the gravestone says. Now, about 25 years ago, a woman moved from the Napa Valley to Herman, Missouri. And she was excited, she was thrilled because she knew about George Hussman and his role out in the Napa Valley. And she knew that this was his, basically his, his hometown, it's where he grew up, Herman. And she told people she was happy to be in Herman because George Hussman used to live in Herman. And the people in Herman, Missouri said to her, George who? That's right. Herman, Missouri had forgotten about George Hussman. So this woman from the Napa Valley wants to rectify thing and things. And she wrote the book, the, the biography of George Hussman. Linda Walker Stevens is her name. Now, because of her book, George Hussman is now known back in his hometown of Herman, Missouri. There is a winery, the G. Hussman Winery. Here is a picture of the building. And remember George Hussman made wine in Missouri and made wine in California. So what kind of wine does this, this winery in Herman, Missouri make? The answer is uh, one of these choices. And choice number three, they make blended Missouri and California wines. And that's uh, in, in honor of George Hussman. So here's a bottle from the G. Hussman Winery, American wine. And here's the Oak Glen Winery. This was established by somebody 1997, again in honor of George Hussman, because this is the land that Hussman owned when he lived here. And he, um, the guy who started this new winery up wanted to honor George Hussman by, by using, being in the same property and actually had Five rows of Norton vines, still there, still there. And here is what the Oak Glen Winery calls their, their tasting room, the George Hussman Wine Pavilion, right? So now here in Herman, they are, they have recognized George Hussman once more for his influence in the wine industry. So when Hussman was here, when in the, the glory days of Missouri wine, starting in the, the, early, the 1830s, 1840s, and going on up until the early 20th century. These were the glory days. And here is Herman Hoff. And I'm mentioning this winery because it's a magnificent winery. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. And it goes back to 1852. And there's some nice stone buildings, more brick buildings. and then prohibition came along. Prohibition meant for wine growers, your vineyards are uprooted, your equipment is destroyed. Some people in Herman managed to ship stuff to Europe before it was destroyed, but prohibition is, becomes a long sleep 
a long sleep. Adam Pukta, we're gonna mention this guy. He also was in California. He went out there for the, um, the gold rush of 1849. He came back and he founded the oldest continuously family owned winery in the United States, seven generations. So in the glory days, they're making wine here at the Adam Pukta Winery, which is in Herman. When, when Adam went out to California, he took a herd of cattle with him and <laughs> sold the cattle there. Uh, so he was more of a profit maker rather than a, a gold digger. He uh, came back via Nicaragua and he created a winery, 1855. Stone Hill, we got to mention Stone Hill. And this is 1857. Notice the guy who started this winery had no prior winemaking experience. It's a plus. It's a plus. No winemaking experience. Here's one of their nice buildings and 35 acres of vineyards, giant casks, making lots and lots of wine. This was the third largest winery in the world, in the world, starting by a, started by a man who had never made a drop of wine before. Okay, it, it uh, was recognized around the world. Uh, it uh, won a gold medal at the Vienna World's Fair, beating out all sorts of European wines. And that's a picture of the uh, Vienna World's Fair. And uh, just a little note, Battleship Missouri, 1902, uh, that version of the battleship was christened with a bottle of Stonehill Norton wine. Well, Prohibition comes along. And prohibition lasts this period. And Missouri becomes the 37th state to uh, ratify the 30, uh, to ratify the prohibition. That's the 18th Amendment. Missouri was the 37th state. By the way, out there in California, you folks were the 22nd state to ratify uh, prohibition. Anyway, this is what happens with uh, all the liquor, which includes wine. Um, well, any existing wine is dumped out, the casks are destroyed, the wineries are out of business, the grapevines are ripped out. And you have prohibition. Now prohibition, you should think about what comes to your mind or uh, well, here's a, one wine cask that survived, quite, quite a pretty one. Um, but you think about bootleggers and speakeasies, but bootleggers made beer and whiskey, which you can do in a basement, just get a few ingredients together and in a short time, you've got something that you can sell in a speakeasy. But a winery, you gotta grow the grapes uh, and grapevines take a long time before they fruit and you just can't bounce back. You can't make illegal wine. So um, the wine industry just disappeared, just disappeared. Except near St. James, Missouri and St. James, was settled by winemakers from Italy. And remember, I told you this is a negative to be a, a, a European winemaker, to come to the United States and try to make wine. And this is exactly what happened. They came to Arkansas and absolutely failed. So then they heard about the Missouri River Valley and they came up to the Missouri River Valley and failed again. But people in neighboring towns St. James, for example, where they were growing Concord grapes, told these Italian people about Concord grapes, and the Italians started growing Concord grapes, which thrived and saved them, saved them. Again, you, want, you can't use Italian grape, Italian grape growing methods in, in America because of this, you have all these factors that have to come in to have a grape vines survive, uh, thrive. So these Italians made con uh, had conquered grapes and got a contract with Welch's grape juice. And of course that is not prohibited in prohibition and those uh, wineries survived. And um, they saved their vines be because they, they were growing conquered grapes. So, those, those particular wineries were saved and you can still have a few, a few acres of pre-prohibition vines in St. James. So prohibition ends 
and you have to rebuild the wine industry. And of course you have to rebuild it out in California as well. But let's see, California is called the golden state. But Missouri has a very different nickname. Missouri is called the show me state. Show me, okay. So rebuild our wine industry. State law wasn't very favorable. And pretty much people were reluctant. Show me. Missouri had just lived through 13 years of prohibition. And the Missourians said, show me the federal government is not going to do this again. That was their attitude. There was no guarantee that the federal government would start re restart prohibition. So Missourians were basically reluctant to start up these wineries. It was 1933, they could have started. Um, in 1940s, licenses got a little more generous, and but winemaking didn't restart until the 60s. That is again, the show me attitude. People just were afraid that the federal government was going to make things uh, impossible again. So Adam Pukta, I mentioned him, he was rebuilt and they, um, they turned in themselves into a traditional farm. And then these guys, the Pukta family, they started growing vines and making wine again. And this is the family that has, they've owned this uh, winery for seven generations. They were making wine, you could make wine for your family to, even during prohibition. Uh, but after prohibition, they only made for the family and then they just needed some push. And then they are now making wine and growing grapes. 1990, 1990, that's how long it took this family to restart making wine. It's the show me state. Stone Hill, their, their cellars became mushroom caves and um, they, the uh, guy who owned them in 1965, those mushroom caves, he, he wanted to get out of the mushroom business and he invited two, uh, this farmer couple, Jim and Betty Held, to come and take a look. And <laughs> Jim and Betty Held came and took a look and they bought Stone Hill. They started making wine and they renovated Stone Hill. So that, that um, became a going concern and is uh, still a rather large winery and uh, with a very nice restaurant that attracts people and tourists. Hermann Hoff mentioned uh, Hermann Hoff before. Again, this closed during prohibition, sat empty for years and years in the show me state. And 74, this is 40 years after prohibition ends, the Deerberg family uh, buys this. Now, we know the Deerbergs in Missouri as the owner of a, a very nice supermarket chain, but in California, the Deerbergs are known as a wine growing uh, couple. Here they are, that's uh, Jim and Mary. They're at their California winery, which is in Santa Barbara County. So they started growing making wine in, in Santa Barbara and they decided that they would also start up wine in Herman and they re reinstated the Herman Hoff winery. So here um, they, they, they have a big complex which includes Herman Hoff and includes three California vineyards selling wine from those vineyards in Herman Hoff at, at uh, Herman, Missouri. So here is the uh, main tasting room and they have white oak casts and they continue to make wine in Herman Hoff. So the wine industry is going now uh, very well. And let's look at the whole state, Missouri wine regions. And we're gonna look at it in terms of AVAs. It's an American viticultural area and it is determined by the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, the federal government. And the very first AVA, that's the Department of Treasury here, very first, oh, let's take a look at, sorry, we're gonna look here, up here in the corner, 
We have a little AVA up there. We have a big AVA called the Ozark Mountain AVA. We have the Ozark Highlands AVA. And we have the Herman AVA, but we are very proud to have the Augusta AVA because it was the first AVA in the United States, 1980. Anyone out there in Napa Valley want to guess what the second AVA was? That's right, you guys, Napa Valley, 81. Okay, so there's Augusta. Now, the economic impact to the state of Missouri, figures, figures for 2017, $3.2 billion, annual wages of 1 billion, 28,000 jobs, tourists come to Missouri for the wine, and that's called agritourism. And I'm sure you folks out there are familiar with agritourism. Well, you have, I believe it's University of California, Davis. We have Missouri State University and they have an Associate of Applied Science in Enology and they have their own little, their own sessions in how to manage a winery through uh, all the process of making wine. Here's somebody doing some research at Missouri State. We have an experiment station, research programs, public education, certification, USDA quarantine, Center for Grapevine Biotechnology, uh, and Vesta Viticulture and Enology Science and Technology Alliance, all at Missouri State University. And uh, this is connection with other universities across the country. University of Missouri, which we don't call, the University of Missouri, we call it Mizzou. And uh, Mizzou has viticulture, that's the cultivation of grapes. And here is somebody uh, talking about viticulture and it's a Bachelor of Science and they, they have also a Master and Doctor of Philosophy degrees viticulture. But enology, it's a separate um, set of classes and it's a Bachelor of Science in Food Services. And here is a comment about people who, the students at Mizzou who sign up for enology, they think they're gonna be tasting wine and drinking wine, but then they discover they have to study chemical structures <laughs> and it's real science, not just sitting around sipping. So here's the University of Missouri. And they also have the Institute for Continental Climate viticulture and enology. Climate, of course, becoming very important in growing grapes. And we have a state wine board, and we have a grape and wine institute, and uh, that has a big effect. We have those wine organizations in Missouri. Here's the grape and wine board. And we tax wine, and that just creates the Missouri Grape and Wine Board, Department of Agriculture. Yes, and that's uh, to promote wine in Missouri. Okay, and then we have the Vintners Association. They lobby, they lobby in Jefferson City. Great Growers Association, and they uh, solve problems, in which case a big problem nowadays is chemical spray drift. As farmers aerial spray, that drifts over into the vineyards and affects them. So how to deal with that is one thing they're interested in the Grape Growers Association. And they have a conference every year and what are they gonna call it? They're in Missouri. So it's the Show Me Grape and Wine Conference. Yes, yes, yes. And we've got a research council and um, development fund. So it's all, the, the, the wine industry is, is doing well. But something new, starting just a couple of years ago, is that somebody decided that there's going to be a new Napa Valley, and it's going to be here in Missouri. It's going to be here in Missouri. Big news, big news becoming the Midwestern Napa Valley, $100 million to turn Augusta, Missouri into a national destination. You've probably not heard of Augusta. 
It's got a total population of 262 people. And this guy, one guy wants to make it a national destination. Yes. One developer is doing it. And this guy's name is Hoffman. And he is the owner of the Hoffman family of companies, which are real estate companies in Florida. In Florida. So here is Jerry and David. They grew up in Washington, Missouri, which is very close to Augusta, Missouri. And they moved to Florida and they made a fortune in real estate and they have uh, built a second home up in Missouri in the town of St. Albans because from St. Albans, you can look, it's a clifftop house and you can look down into the valley at Augusta, Missouri. And this is where Jerry and David are investing a hundred million dollars, hundred million dollars. They want a destination. And their words, every bit as pretty as Napa Valley out in California. So there's Augusta, population 265. Yes, hotel, restaurant, golf course, amphitheater, trolleys, pally, paddle boats. This is going to be a wine cruise boat to um, do wine cruises in the Missouri River. And of course, you need to get people around. And uh, the Hoffmans simply bought a bus company. They didn't buy buses, they bought a bus company. So that's their bus company. They're gonna need workers if they're gonna be a national destination. So uh, first of all, the hotel and conference center, they're gonna build a, a nice glorious one. And this is what they own in the town of Augusta already, the pink part, that's the Hoffmans, what they own. But all the buildings in, in Augusta are getting a facelift of some kind, uh, even if it's not involved with wine. And they, uh, they're just, just perking up in this town. And as a little gimmick, the Hoffman's got a whole bunch of 1954 Ford pickups and put the pickup and they placed the pickup tr trucks around town. And they got trolleys to take tourists around to the various uh, vineyards in Augusta. So they need workers. And this is an old evangelical, German evangelical church seminary which is uh, sitting empty and they are bought it. It's not too far away from Augusta. They bought it and they'll provide free housing for 200 employees. So they're thinking ahead, they're thinking ahead. So America's first wine reason, Augusta, the Hoffmans have managed to buy four fairly sizable existing wineries. One, two, three, four. Uh, the fourth one, Mount Pleasant, I have been to more recently, and uh, every person I spoke to at Mount Pleasant Estates was so happy that the Hoffmans are pouring all this money into their their winery as well as their town. So um, they are they are very pleased that that uh, they are headed to be the new Napa Valley. Uh, this is another vineyard, the Baldici. It's one of the four view of the Balducci, the Augusta. This is also a Hoffman brewery. And you can see the trolley there going around. Here's Mount Pleasant, a fairly spacious um, winery. And um, this was another story, just like all the other wineries that existed. Prohibition came along, show me state, remained empty. So these people bought Mount Pleasant Winery in 1966. The guy was the youngest person to have a license to operate a winery in the United States. Yes, and established 1859, so it's old. And uh, then they, they uh, that particular winery promoted the idea of making AVAs and that got Augusta to be the first AVA in the country. Here's their oldest building at Mount Pleasant. Uh, so it's fairly, fairly prosperous. Here's another winery, the Montel. You can see the river in the background. And here's the countryside, people dining on the, on the terraces. So, new Napa Valley. 
What do the locals think? What do the locals think? Well, this guy went out there uh, actually to that very, um, very same balcony you saw before and the, uh, the Hoffmans cut down all the trees that shaded the balcony. And this guy was, was uh, pissed off here. Um, he didn't want us, he wanted to uh, drink wine in the shade of a tree rather than the shade of an umbrella. So he wasn't happy. And uh, here's some people who are just the townspeople and they're, they're mixed feelings. Uh, they're, they, uh, they've seen their town decline over the years and uh, the wineries are, are being boosted, but what about the rest of the town? So there's mixed feelings from the locals there. And, but many people are against all this money coming in. And um, farmers, they're, they, they, they're worried about traffic. It's a two lane road that goes out to Augusta from east and from west, it's two lanes. And of course you're gonna have people going to wineries, they're gonna drink and they're gonna drive on a two lane road and farmers move their equipment on two lane roads and they're not happy, they're not happy. Plus you have people that deliberately moved to Augusta because they wanted a very rural lifestyle and that's being uh, uprooted by um, all this new development, new things happening in Augusta. Whoops. Oh, somebody, uh, somebody talking about Napa Valley said, whoa, doesn't, doesn't uh, not, so, not so nice out in Napa. But in any event, the new Napa, we're going to see what happens because they're starting to build that up. Now, here's the final fact for you. Um, artificial grape flavoring. You may go, yuck, artificial grape flavoring, but it's a necessity. If we made, if we use real grapes to make grape soda and grape candy, there wouldn't be any real grapes left over to produce wine. So there is your, um, your fact. So the next time you see grape soda for sale, saying, oh, that means I can have wine because grape, grape sodas have artificial flavor.